Good morning. How are we all? So I'm going to give that about a 6 out of 10. Is that about the average that we're <laughs> going with this morning? It's so good to be here with you. It's, um, I've been able to join you a couple of times, which is great, and I'm each time now, there's more times that I've joined you in person than online. So we're celebrating those little milestones as we go. It's great. But it's also um, my privilege to bring you the greetings of the rest of your Baptist family. Um, I work at the support hub not far from here. I'm going to point to the office, but I don't know which direction it is. Thank you. I always just go, I work at the office, but it's actually over there. Excellent. And I was saying to Pay this morning, if traffic was like it was this morning, when I come up from Geelong to the Camberwell office during the week, my life would be like 97% better. Well, maybe not quite that much. It doesn't impact me quite that dramatically. But it is... Um, it is great to come and see what God's up to in our local churches. We are so excited for all, we've got over 250 churches across our Baptist family and each time we get to connect in with a different part of that, we see that God is up to so many great things in very different ways because each church is in a different community and is meeting different needs and is filled with different people and so it's always great to come and hear what's going on and then to be able to report that back to our um, support hub. If you you follow us on social media, the um, BUV Support Hub has an Instagram account and a Facebook account, and we each week we notify our entire Baptist family to be praying for individual churches with, within um, our, our network of, of churches, and so you know that you get prayed for, not just by those of us who are in the office, but also by the rest of the um, people who are part of the Baptist community across Victoria. Um, when C comes up, because we do it in alphabetical order, because it's nice and orderly that way. But it's also lovely to have, I see Emmy up there and Gracie over here. There's a lot of ways that um, your leadership and, and people from your congregation connect in with the the resources of the support hub, that um, leadership training, the things that we're able to offer. Um, Hannah, who's not here today, is part of one of our cohorts and our um, generations network, and it's just great to be able to encourage um, the work that you are all up to. But as you see on the screen there today, we are continuing in your series around encounters with Jesus. And um, when Nathan invited me to speak, he said, you know, you can choose any passages out of Luke, any passage out of Luke to to um, to speak about today. And he also sent the same message to Bill Brown, who was here previous couple. He did two weeks, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, and he beat me in replying to the email, and he took my passages. And we had a little bit of a discussion, but he won, because of course he won. Um, so today, you see that we are preaching from, I mean, it's, there's so many great passages to, to draw from out of Luke, and so today we're looking at the feeding of the 5,000. But I wondered if we can do another re-reading of it together, now that you've had a warm-up, and it's going to come up on the screen, and I'm going to read it, but you're going to call out any numbers Okay, any word, any word that's a number, not the little, let's show the screen, um, not, the, not the little red numbers of the verse, okay, but the word numbers, the number words. So are you, have you got your glasses on or your squinty eyes or something to sort of zoom in here? So anytime there's a number, I want to hear it. Are you ready? Okay. Here we go. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. He took with them, took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the good work came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only loaves of bread and fish. <laughs> Did we turn over the page? And unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about the each. The disciples did so and everyone sat down, taking the loaves and the fish and looking up to heaven he gave thanks and broke them then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people they all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 
basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Give yourselves a clap with your number reading. That was very excellent. Like, you did better at that than telling me how you were. So, it was, so we're getting, your grade is improving as the morning goes along. We're doing well. Nod your head if you've heard that story before, that Bible story before. It's a fairly common one, isn't it? It's one that we've heard many times for some people. It could be new for others. But it is also one that's repeated across all four of the, the Gospels. It's mentioned in all of them. Not all of the story. There's overlap between the Gospels and not always will a story um, be sh- show up in all of them, but this particular one does. And we'll cross-reference to those other accounts as we're unpacking it this morning because it adds a little bit of detail and colour to the story and that's helpful for us. But when we talk about encounters with Jesus, 37 of the times that encounters with Jesus are recorded in Scripture and sometimes repeated as we see here with this one, it's when Jesus performs a miracle Many of the times um, individuals encounter Jesus, it's because he heals them. Leprosy, the crippled, healed from blindness, blood disorder, and even a couple are raised from the dead. But the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is definitely one of his larger scale miracles, right? The 5,000 people mentioned here are men only. Now, it's significant to note that because The estimated number of the crowd, if you were including the women and children, who we know for sure were present, would have been as many as 20,000 people. Some suggest that the reason that they only note the men, other than that's pretty common practice in terms of the storytelling of the time, but 5,000 is the number that's the equivalent of a full Roman legion, which is the largest military unit of the Roman army. And so for early century readers of this story, to hear 5,000 men would have triggered a bit of a picture. They, they get that. That's a sort of a unit of measurement that might have helped them understand just how large the crowd was. But let's face it, 5,000, 20,000, any number over one (laughs) being fed by one lunch is a miracle, right? Just the disciples alone, if they had have been fed by this one kid's lunch, that would have been a, a, a miracle that would have made the miracle amazing but in some ways then the size of the crowd doesn't really matter because it doesn't make it any more miraculous because anytime you're able to feed more people than the food that you have it's a miracle right but it just the scale of it in some ways doesn't doesn't change it it just means there were more witnesses to the miracle there were more people who encountered Jesus in that moment But the 12 weren't prepping for a miracle. In verse 12, you see there, it says that they told Jesus to send all the people away. They went, woohoo, there's 20,000 people here. This is going to be the best miracle ever. They were like, let's get rid of them. It's food, it's mealtime. They need to go. They were suggesting that they send them to to spread out into surrounding villages and hopefully there they could find food for themselves and maybe somewhere to sleep. And for us today, we can read these stories and we're like, guys, start expecting more of Jesus. <laughs> like, have you got the picture? Like, Jesus can do some things that we don't expect him to be able to do. He's already performed 18 other miracles by the time we get to this story. Why wouldn't you ask him for one here? But these guys are just being surprised one moment at a time right now. They're like, each time Jesus does something miraculous, they're like, oh. Oh, and it's, it's like a, they're still sort of awakening to exactly who he is and what he can do. And they certainly hadn't seen a feed a whole bunch of people from nothing miracle before this point, right? So when he says, you give them something to eat, they're for sure thinking he's pulling their leg. <laughs> like, he's joking, isn't he? Like, the boys are like going, what's he talking about? You, you get them something to eat. No, you get them something to eat. But if you look at John's account of this event, He records a little bit more of a conversation between Philip and Jesus in this moment. In chapter 6 of John, verse 5, it says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wage to buy enough bread for each person to have one bite. And this adds a little more drama and a little more scale to the story. They're genuinely trying to work out how on earth they're going to feed this crowd. Where could we even buy 
bread. Like, Philip, you're local. Where's the nearest shop in town? You know, who can help us out with this problem we have? And you can imagine it's pretty tongue-in-cheek because he's looking at a crowd of close to 20,000 people and he's like, Philip, you can sort this out for us, can't you? And Philip's like, oh, yeah, right, no. And even if I could find somewhere that could supply that much bread, we could spend half a year's wage and it still wouldn't be enough for people to have more than a bite, which is not going to be sufficient. And I think even then that's hyperbole because I don't think 20,000 bites of bread um, would be still possible to gather, you know, in terms of how much bread they would need to, to make that possible. When Mark is recounting this incident, he says that Jesus asked them, well, how many loaves do we have? If you're not going to go to the shops and buy some, (laughs) what are we working with here? And the, the phrase says, go and see. Go and see. John chapter 6, 8 says another of his disciples, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Barley loaves were a particular kind of bread and essentially it was the food of the poor. Andrew had not only stolen the lunch of a child, but he had taken it from a poor child at that. But Jesus sends them out to find bread and Andrew comes back with this small lunch. And it's interesting to consider, and I don't know how you deal with stories in the Bible, I try to kind of jump in there, and because this is a real story, it's not like a fairy tale, it actually happened, so trying to make myself present in the moment, and having a look around and thinking about the dynamics of that, was that the only lunch that was in the crowd? Was this small boy the only person who had come with lunch, or had he somehow made his lunch known to Andrew as he walked past or was Andrew yelling out anyone got any lunch like how did, it's an interesting thing to consider why this one lunch how did it how was it that Andrew um, discovered this or was it only Andrew that went searching there was 12 of them did any of the others go asking the same thing you know were there people there with their lunch going don't tell him about your lunch hide your lunch the guy's coming he's looking for lunches you know it's a, I, I like to think about that because we only get a very small snapshot, even with the four overlays of, of this story. There's only bits, isn't there, of, of how this takes place. And we'll come back to Andrew in a moment because I think it's an important part of the, the message this morning. But Andrew hands over the lunch, five small barley loaves, two small fish, probably pickled or salted in some way to preserve them rather than just carrying around two floppy fresh fish in his, in his pocket. Um, And Luke's account has Jesus instructing the disciples to get the crowd to gather into groups of 50 and sit down. But that's still 400 groups of people. I I don't know how many people we would have here this morning, but can you just even picture 400 groups of 50? This is something on an enormous scale to try and coordinate that. I used to be a school teacher, and that just makes me like have you know, tremors, imagining trying to get 400 groups of 50 to sit still and down together in, um, in an orderly kind of fashion. But if you think about it too, there's 12 disciples. That's at least like more than 30 groups each that the disciples are trying to, like this is epic. <laughs> the scale of it is incredible. And Jesus instructs them all to sit down because that was back in the day when children were much more, be, you know, obedient. They just sat down when they were told. So I'm clear, clearly that's what happened there as well. So, um, but then Jesus says grace, essentially. And um, as I say, I like to truly try and imagine what scenes like this look like. Jesus says, okay, let's all bow our heads to give thanks. Like he's sitting down to a full spread of dinner or something like that. And maybe it's just me, but I would not be bowing my head or closing my eyes. I'd be like, are you, is he serious? Like, I'm like half an eye open at least. Like, what is he doing here? Let's pray and give thanks. What are you giving thanks for? You've got this measly little lunch and 400 groups of 50 people sitting down waiting for you to do something about it. Small child's lunch. And now we've got these organised pods of hungry people expecting something of us. What is going on? And given that the story appears in all four of the Gospels, you'd think one of them would have thought to give us just a little more detail about exactly what did happen next, right? Because all we know is that um, that all, 
all four descriptions say that Jesus gave, the, gave them to the disciples, whatever them is. You know, he hands over out of five, out of seven items, he hands them over to 12 people. Right? What's going on? But he says, um, you know, the disciples are then distributing them to the people. Like distributing what from what? Like where does it, there's a, some steps missing. I feel like there's a missing piece in that, like a page has been torn out of the story. It's like, no, hang on, hang on, hang on, we've skipped a little bit. Tell me how that worked. And then all the Gospels say that all the people ate and they were all satisfied and somehow there were leftovers. And the disciples each grabbed a basket and went around saying, are you finished with this? Have you had enough? Is that, is that, is that spare? Can I take that from you? <laughs> like tidying up after this group of people. It's crazy. And there's so much to unpack in, that, in this story for us this morning. But what I do want to do is to drill down on one aspect of it in terms of how we might take on some personal meaning and some personal application for our own circumstances today. The title that I gave this message is Small Gifts in God's Hands because I think that's where we see the real miracle take place. There's an exchange of something small and meaningless for something significant and meaningful when it's surrendered to the hands of Jesus. <coughs> Next week for me marks the 20-year anniversary of when I first began vocational pastoral ministry. So I've been doing a bit of reflecting this month around the whole journey that has been um, part of that, but also how this all got started for me. And it, prior to the conversation that I had with my senior pastor in 2003, don't raise your hand if you weren't born then, I don't want to know about it, that's okay. Um, I, had never, I had never even considered paid vocational ministry. He asked for a meeting with me and he talked to me about what he was sensing for the future of the church. And the church had just been through a fairly significant time of conflict. And so the church had sort of shrunk. It was small. It was quite tired, you know, from the, the hurt and the, the process that had been part of that. And he said that he felt God saying that, he, um, that God's plans for the healing of the church and for the reestablishing of, of the numbers and core membership and also for the future health, health of the church in a rapidly developing part of the state out there in the West included an emphasis on generational ministry. Lots of young families were moving into the area and the church would need to orient itself to serve them. And he thought there was a role for me to play in that. And despite having grown up in the church all my life and serving in ministry since I could remember, I think I was about eight years old when I was in charge of our creche, right? You know, little babies on my hip, this is, would not work today in child safety requirements and all the things that, that are necessary, but that was us back in the day. Um, I had regularly been involved in directing and leading on holiday youth camps. Um, I was frequently even in that moment at the church leading kids talks and worship and I rarely missed a Sunday service but until that moment it had never even crossed my mind to consider doing any of those things as a job you know, for work. Perhaps it was because I'd actually never known a female pastor myself and so I didn't have that model to emulate. Maybe it was influenced a bit by the fact that um, most of my church context as I grew up had been quite small, so some hadn't even had a paid senior pastor, let alone other pastoral staff. And But now that I've travelled 20 years of ministry and felt the fit of that for myself, it's, it seems almost comical to reflect on the fact that it just had never been on my radar and so in the office of my senior pastor, I responded with surprise and sort of nervous laughter at the suggestion, oh, that sounds interesting, what? And uh, not long after that moment, though, I was reading the story of Moses, um, part of his story that's recorded in Exodus chapter 3, and I found a completely relatable narrative. God speaks to Moses through a burning bush. That bit's not so relatable, but bear with me. We'll get to the relatable bit. He says to Moses that he's heard the cry of the Israelites. He's seen their suffering and their misery under slavery in Egypt. And he has a plan to rescue them that appears to be largely centred on Moses. 
It seems Moses responded there with surprise and nervous laughter also. He is immediately gripped with self-doubt and fear. Who am I that I should go, he says. What will I say to them? What if they don't believe me or listen to me? And I didn't mean to be quoting directly from Scripture in that meeting with my senior pastor, but it turns out I was doing a terrific Moses impersonation because I was asking similar questions. Who, me? But what do I know? What if I can't? He also suggested that one day soon um, I would be preaching. And at that point, it went from nervous laughter to actual laugh out loud. I was like, that's insane. But... I'm no dummy. I've read further in the story and I know that Moses took his questioning and his hesitance just a little bit too far. In the end, he, in fact, he said, please just pick someone else. And the Bible says the Lord's anger burned against Moses and there were consequences for him. So it's, it's a life motto of mine to always make new mistakes. You know, not just repeat the mistakes of other people. So I decided to pause with the protest and the fear and and just say yes. And to start with, that was just yes to further conversations. It was yes to being open to what God might be saying and to trusting the process of discernment, which I did with church leadership and with trusted friends and peers and, and also just in my own heart and my own time with God. And there were some other affirming experiences and words along that journey um, that fed into it. But There was also initially some resistance in the congregation or from some in the congregation. There's a few spicy conversations that took place, some of them with me, most of them about me. And um, it all had this process of of discernment and wrestling and understanding what God was was asking for or leading us to. And a few months later, the church affirmed my appointment to staff as a part-time children's and youth coordinator. And then I was on staff there for over 14 and a half years, added theological study and to my education qualifications and increased my hours to eventually be full time and got to lead and develop teams in a very quickly growing church and expanding ministries and got to explore my gifts and my skills and my calling in in a really encouraging environment, great opportunity and lots of support. And when I finished my time there, I was an associate pastor and subsequently then moved into this role, this denominational state role, which I feel most privileged to have. But when I reflect on that journey through the lens of today's story, I feel a little like that small child's lunch, (laughs) such a measly offering. No theological training, personal circumstances that were really messy and challenging at the time. I was a whole ball of insecurities and uncertainties about my own capacity and skills, very fearful of what others would think of me. And I wasn't sure I was ready for the responsibility. And there was a whole lot of other doubts and fears and things I could go on about. But essentially, I was just five small barley loaves and two salted fish before a crowd of 20,000 people I needed a miracle, right? And it happened, maybe not to the level of drama and scale of feeding 20,000 people, but God did use me and has used me to feed and lead in a congregation and his people and to grow ministry teams and to invest in emerging leaders. And there's great fruit in that. You know, various programs and ministry connected people who were far from God and led them into community and sometimes a faith response to Jesus. These were, you know, there's heaps of individual stories of personal revelation of gift and call and watching people step up to serve and lead and impact in their workplaces and their school and through our church. And over the last 20 years, there's been a miracle of fruitfulness that God has used me to play just a very small part in A small gift in God's hands can do miracles. I guess in my story, the senior pastor played the role of Andrew. (laughs) He went looking for what there was available and didn't overlook that small lunch. What would have happened if Andrew had seen that lunch and thought, "Mm, that's not enough, that won't do anything, that won't help, that's not even worth taking to Jesus? I wonder what the story might have been. And what if the senior pastor had have looked at me and said, hmm, that's a pretty small offering, <laughs> not bothered to lead me to Jesus and encourage me to make myself available? Who knows, again, what different story might have been written? And so this morning, I want to ask the question of you, of us, what is 
your story in relation to this. Now, as you came in the door, the, the lovely greeters would have given you a piece of paper. Have you all got one? A little picture of a gift. If you don't, they're gonna, they can come and give you one now. Who didn't? Is there anyone who didn't get a picture? There's a couple of raised hands around there. Thanks, guys. And also you'll need a pen. So if you need one of them, raise your hands also. They're coming, coming around. And you'll see on that piece of paper, there's a rough outline there drawn of a gift. And just encourage you to take a moment to consider the the nature of the small gift you might be in God's hands and what it looks like to consider that for yourself. You know, when... um, When we talk about this encounter with Jesus, and I'm sure many of you have had your own encounters with Jesus where you've seen and, you know, witnessed him at work, where there's been an impact of um, his activity in your life. We've found you scurrying there. Good job. Whether it's through scripture or it's in your own life or it's in the lives of people around you, there's there's a sense that we understand the invitation. We understand the call. But I wonder what, you have to surrender to Jesus? What is the small gift that when given over to God might be able to do great things in his hands? And as we think about that, I remember um, preaching this message um, or something similar very early in my ministry time and and one of the, the young women came as we were sort of sitting in this time of ministry and she said, I, I have nothing to write down. I cannot think of one thing that I can offer to Jesus. And the reality is all of us have something. And it was a beautiful thing actually to watch her come to realise that in the moment, but also has it unpacked in her life, you know, to say, actually, I've got a lot to, to offer Jesus. And also I don't have to have much to offer Jesus to be useful because of how he multiplies you know, how he magnifies what it is that we bring. So for some of you, um, what you need to offer to Jesus is your time. You know, there's a, a surrendering of that. Some of you need to offer the control of your schedule to say, actually, God, maybe you could be in charge in, of this and you could do something better with my time than I'm, I'm um, currently doing. For some of you, it's to identify, actually, I have, I have these skills or I have these capacities or I have these passions and they need to be surrendered to God. I need to identify that actually He might be able to do something with those that I've not yet considered. And it may feel measly. It may feel like a stinky fish lunch. But this message today reminds us that He can do anything with anything. Right? And so maybe... It's to consider for some of us what holds us back from offering those things over to Him. You know, when we're sitting and this morning we're invited to be thinking about being part of Alpha and all the different ways that we can serve. And there's there's ways there to serve that literally anyone could do because it's show up and open a door. (laughs) You know, there's all the way through to very skill-specific thing. Please do not offer to cook if you can't cook. It's okay. We don't need that, all right? There's people who can do that for you. But thinking through, like, when you listen to that, some people say, I... the story that comes up, the, the narrative that runs around in your brain is, I have nothing to offer there. I have nothing to give. I, I'm not able to be useful here. So thinking through some of what holds us back in that as well. And so on that piece of paper, what could you write down as, as your small gift, as your offering to Jesus of what it is that you think maybe in this moment He's asking you to surrender to Him. And in writing it down, it's like we agree with Jesus that we have it (laughs) because He already knows. Like He's not sort of, well, I wonder what they'll write down. I'll find out what they can do, right? He already knows. But when we write it down, it's like we agree with Him. Yes, God, I know you've given me these gifts. Yes, God, I know you've given me this time or these resources, this finance. I know that you've given me this heart for a certain people or for a certain thing. 
I know that you've given me capacity and um, I know that you've given me experience or qualification in these things. When we write those down, we're agreeing with God that they are part of how He's shaped us and and part of how He's um, invested things in us spiritually that could be useful to His kingdom. And in writing it down in that space, within that sort of small gift picture, I think it's an acknowledgement that we, that we need His miraculous power to breathe on that and make it something more significant and make it more useful, to take it from what we could do with it ourselves and connect it into His broader kingdom work and by His Spirit, multiply the fruitfulness, multiply the impact of that. So just take a few moments, allow God to speak however that whatever that means to you and you know however it is that he prompts you trust that those things that are coming to mind right now are maybe from him (laughs) and write down what have you got to offer what do you need to surrender what can you what's your small gift that you can offer up to him wonder also if there's a an opportunity to to put on your Andrew hat right now and just who does God bring to mind that you might be Andrew for that you might bring them before God you know offer them you know or prompt them to offer themselves and you know as in my situation where a senior pastor says I think you have something to give here is there someone that you know in, our congr- in your congregation that you would, you could be an encouragement to? And even just to write that name if it comes to your mind, um, write that on the piece of paper as well just to prompt you um, to think about that. But who is it that you could go to and say, I think you have something to give here. I think you have something to offer. And I want to help you bring that to Jesus and bring that before God. I wonder if we could all stand holding our piece of paper. I am going to ask you to bring it down the front here to put in a little gift bag soon. But before that, I want to pray for us. So let's all stand holding your little piece of paper. God, it's an incredible thing to to look across this room of people and imagine just the the breadth and the creativity and the diversity and the extent of all the things that you've given to each of your children here that if we are able to offer and surrender them to you could be used, multiplied, magnified for your kingdom purposes. God, we want to be part of the miracles that you're doing of the lives that you're changing, of the the transformation that you're bringing. And sometimes that can seem completely overwhelming. It can seem so big and so vast and so hard that it's hard to know what what part we can play. But this reminder this morning that you take the smallest of offerings, the willing heart, the surrendering, and you can turn it into something incredible. And we just want to be part of what you're up to. We want to be um, fulfilling our, our role in the, in the Great Commission of, of being part of making disciples. We want to be um, investing in, in the building up of our church. We want to be those who are utilising everything that you've given us. That we're not squandering any of the, the skills and the passion and the gift and the heart that you've given us. And so I pray, Lord, just these words that are written on these pieces of paper, And just the the thoughts that have gone around that as we've considered this, just by your Spirit, would you just breathe your life onto those? Would you just um, help them to sink deep into our our hearts and our spirit, a growing conviction that, that 
eradicates or pushes back all of those thoughts and those words of fear or insecurity or doubt that might threaten, that might hold us back from that, um, from the offering and from the surrendering. And would you find us faithful, God? Would you find us obedient? Would you find us generous to take up our part in your kingdom? We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So as the team leads us in our um, final song, I encourage you to come up and just as, a, just as an act of release to drop that in the, um, the gift bag up here, it's just as part of your, I think sometimes it's that physicality of kind of having to, you know, not just shove it in your pocket and kind of <laughs> hope no one noticed that that's what I said and Jesus forgets about it. <laughs> um, but to come forward and say, no, I really want to release this. And if, if it's hard for you to get forward, ask someone next to you to say, can you take mine with you? Or um, someone can come and collect it from you, I'm sure. But let's, let's do that as the team leads us in worship.